Good morning, church, and welcome. We are greetings, I should say, from Texas. Uh, we are going to miss you this Sunday in person, but thankful for technology that we can uh, do this recording online. Um, we have been here in Texas. Our oldest daughter, Haley, um, is getting married on Saturday. By the time you watch this, she will be married. Um, and we've been spending time with our sending church, Calvary Chapel of West Houston. Um, and so it's been a blessing uh, just to be here. And so this morning we have a special Bible study um, from the book of Psalms. Uh, and if you will turn to Psalm 23, that's where we're going to begin. So let's uh, turn to Psalm 23. We'll read the Psalm, we'll pray, um, and then we'll start our Bible study. So it says in Psalm 23, the Lord, the shepherd of his people, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. <clears throat> my cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> so let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning. Once again, for your word, we thank you that we can gather together, even online, and study it together as a church body, as a church family. And so I pray that as we study this psalm, it's such a special psalm to so many for different reasons, but really it's special to us in the church because it talks about you, our good shepherd. It tells us how good you are. And so I pray that as we begin to look at this and break it down and go through verse by verse, that you would just reveal more of who you are to us and that you would meet us in a special way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay, so Psalm 23 is probably one of, if not the most famous of the Psalms. And now I want to point something out to you. The book of Psalms is a conglomeration of songs. That's what psalm means, is songs. And so it's a conglomeration of psalms that are put together in one book called, and we refer to that as the book of psalms. However, each psalm is a psalm by itself. So we shouldn't say Psalms 23. It's just Psalm 23. It's one psalm that we're studying this morning. Um, but if you notice with me, most of these psalms um, have, it, they're, they're musical in nature. And so you have uh, sort of at the beginning where it tells us who wrote it. It's the Psalm of David. If you look back one psalm at Psalm 22, we have some musical instructions. It says, to the chief musician set to the deer of the dawn, and then it tells us again, it's a Psalm of David. So these are musical instructions, much, much like you would have like an orchestra. It would be written out. It would tell you, you know, to crescendo here and decrescendo there. And it would tell you uh, to get louder here and get softer there. And that's the way that these Psalms are written. Um, they are written in a form of writing called Hebrew poetry. And what it does is it, it typically Hebrew poetry it has um, either one thought that it keeps building upon or it has one thought and then a contrasting thought to it. And so um, here, what we're really doing in Psalm 23 is we're having one psalm that's written and it's just building upon the same thought of the Lord is my shepherd. And so um, we often hear this psalm. Again, it's one of the most famous, if not the most famous psalm. We often hear it where? Where do we hear this psalm the most? 
we we hear it at funerals. We hear it at, on deathbeds when you know someone goes to visit someone uh, that's dying, and they oftentimes they want read Psalm twenty three, and and we do that. It's comforting to read this, but I want to tell you, I want to share with you this morning that this psalm is not about death at all. It's about life. It's about the good life for the sheep that are under the care of the good shepherd. <coughs> and so to, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk for a bit about sheep and shepherds before we really begin to break this down. But the Bible likens people to sheep. And the Bible likens Jesus to a shepherd, the good shepherd. People are either in one of two categories. They're either in the care of the good shepherd or they are outside of his care in another fold with a hireling as their shepherd. So it will help us to understand this relationship between the sheep and the shepherd for a moment if we flip forward to the New Testament to John chapter 10. So if we look at John chapter 10, Beginning in verse 1, <coughs> Jesus is speaking. <clears throat> in your Bibles, this should, if you have a red letter edition, this is all red letter, which indicates that Jesus is speaking. But it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, that same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of of the sheep to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out and when he brings out his own sheep he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice yet they will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers Jesus used his illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. So we learn a few things about the good shepherd. That it says, if there's the good shepherd enters the sheepfold through the door. And to understand this, out in the wilderness, when a shepherd would be with his sheep, they didn't have a barn to put them in. So they would have a makeshift pen that they would have and the shepherd himself would be the door to the sheep pen um, if somebody else were to come in there they didn't come through the door because in order to get through the door they have to go through the shepherd so if they were trying to steal the sheep or do harm to the sheep whether that would be someone stealing the sheep or that was a wolf that was trying to sneak in they would have to come over the walls of the sheep pen in order to rip the sheep off because they had otherwise they would have to come through the shepherd he makes mention that when the door opens the shepherd of the sheep calls the sheep by name hey dave hey patty hey whoever he he calls you by name and the sheep will respond to the voice of the shepherd now, I don't have the, um, I guess, technological acuity to share a screen onto this right now, but there are videos that you can find on YouTube of sheep, uh, shepherds calling their flock of sheep. And, you know, you'll see the sheep way off in the distance and they're sort of doing whatever sheep do. And then the shepherd comes up and he has a special call and you see the sheep, all of a sudden they're doing just kind of munching on grass or whatever. And all of a sudden the shepherd makes his noise or whatever. And the, the sheep just kind of go like this. And then he does it again and they all come running. It's beautiful to watch. But the thing is, that's only for the shepherd. If I were to go out there and try to mock or mimic his call, those sheep would not even pay attention that I'm there. They would either run from me because I'm not their shepherd and they're afraid, or they would just ignore me altogether and continue to eat the grass 
that is there. So we learn some things that the sheep and the shepherd have a very intimate relationship that they really do recognize the voice of their shepherd and they respond when he calls them. Now, if we look back in John 10 at verse seven, it says, then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now we learn something about the, the thief. <coughs> it says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come, the good shepherd, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So a thief comes to do nothing but rip off or to do damage to or to hurt the sheep. The good shepherd cares about the sheep. He wants to give them life, an abundant life, and we'll cover that more back in Psalm 23. Jesus continues, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling is he who does not, is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he abandons it. He leaves the sheep and he flees and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Again, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by them. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. What did Jesus do? He came to die for our sin. He laid his life down because his care for the sheep or for his people is so great. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I must also bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. They're referring to the, the Jews and the Gentiles who will ultimately be saved. Now, Moving down with me to verse 26, Jesus says, But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. So if you belong to Jesus as one of his sheep, you are secure. No one can touch you. Death can't touch you. Disease can't touch you. Kidnappers, robbers, wolves. No one can touch you because you belong to Jesus. And so you're... you're you, as one of his sheep, are the safest, most well taken care of sheep on the planet. And so, again, just so we're clear, the Bible likens people to sheep. Sheep are not bright animals. If you study them at all, sheep cannot take care of themselves. Sheep need a shepherd in order to thrive. A sheep left on its own will just be overgrown with wool. They'll have bugs and burrs and everything stuck in their fur. They'll, they won't eat well. They won't drink well. And they're just a mess. And interestingly enough, in Utah, <coughs> there's a Highway 73 and it goes from where we live in Eagle Mountain. It goes out towards a city called Twila. And when you, when you take this route out that way, it's pretty much barren desert land. Well, I was driving that road one day going out to Tooele to visit our friends over there. And I saw, interestingly enough, I saw a sheep on the side of the road by himself, overgrown with wool, it just looked like a mess. He needed a shepherd, but he had somehow, he was either wild or had gotten away from his flock. And this sheep was just by itself out there next to the road. It looked like he was eating rocks or weeds or something, uh, thistles that were out there. 
and just not taken care of. And it just reminded me of this, that, that a sheep apart from the shepherd cannot take care of itself. And so if you put yourself in the shoes of sheep and you go, okay, what is the Bible saying about me? I am a sheep. I'm one of Jesus's sheep. If you don't, if you're not saved, then you're not part of the flock. You're being cared for by a hireling. You're being cared for, really, you belong to the wolf who wants to do nothing but to steal, kill, and destroy you. But you have the opportunity to belong to the good shepherd. And so what is this communicating about us? We're sheep. The Bible likens us to sheep, so that means I'm not too bright. It means I can't fend for myself. I need a shepherd. Apart from Jesus, he says in the book of John, apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I need my shepherd. I need to stay close to my shepherd. And that's really what Psalm 23 is all about. So if you are interested more in this area of sheep and shepherds, I highly recommend a book. It's a very small one. It's an easy read. It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. It's by a guy named Philip Kellerman. He was in, I forget where he lived, but he was an actual shepherd who tells you his story of saving up his money to buy his first flock. And because it was his money that he saved to buy this flock, he loved his flock and all that he had to do to take care of the sheep and the way that he he looks at Psalm 23 and puts it into real life from a shepherd's perspective. And so it's very good to read. We have a couple of them in our church library. If you're interested in it, I recommend it. Get it. You can read it over the course of a couple of days, bring it back to us, and you'll learn a lot about the sheep shepherd relationship. And he also is a pastor, so he ties it into um, this Psalm 23. Now, back to Psalm 23. As we look at this, I want you to notice that the sheep does nothing and the shepherd does everything. So real quickly, as we look at this in verse one, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Then it goes on and I'm just going to quickly go through these. It says in verse two, he makes me, he leads me. Verse three, he restores me or my soul. He leads again. He does it for his name's sake. Down to, uh, in verse three, you are with me, your rod, your staff, you prepare, you anoint. This is all about what the shepherd has done. No, the sheep doesn't do anything. All the sheep does is hang out with his shepherd. He is so well taken care of because of the shepherd. When I think that I can do anything to save myself, when I think that I can do anything to make myself right with God or to make my, my eternity better, it's because nothing that I have done plays any part in that. The only thing that I need to do is respond and hang out, if we're talking in context, respond and say, yes, I want Jesus to be my shepherd and to hang out with him and stay close to him and allow myself to never leave the side of my shepherd, knowing that if I do that, I have it made. And you say, well, what about if I get the diagnosis from the doctor? What about if I lose my job? What about if our country goes to war? (coughs) What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Well, what if the Bible tells us that if we stay close to our shepherd, He's giving us everything that we need. If I get that diagnosis and it takes my life or I die in a car wreck or something else, I'm still taken care of because I belong to the good shepherd. Our eternity is secure. We are safe in his hands. We don't have to worry about what tomorrow holds because Jesus holds tomorrow, right? That sounds pretty cliche, but it's true. So back to verse one, the Lord is my shepherd. What I want again to reflect on is this psalm 
is all about life. It's about, it's a sheep, it's told from the perspective of one of the sheep. And this sheep that is telling the story is telling us about the good life that he lives because of his shepherd. And remember, David the psalmist, who was also David the king, was a shepherd boy. And he understands the relationship. And you can imagine him out there with his sheep thinking about, man, my sheep have it good because, <coughs> excuse me, because of the way that I take care of them. I do everything for these sheep. Oh, wait, God, you take care of me. You do everything for me. I'm like your sheep. And you can see like how it all comes to his mind as he writes this. But he's writing from the perspective of the sheep. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's proud, puffed out chest. Because of him, I shall not want. Or lack is that word. I shall not lack. What do you mean? I shall not lack. Jesus said what? If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added to you. What is he talking about? In the context of Matthew chapter six, he's talking about shelter, water and food and clothing. You say, well, I live in an apartment. That's not where I want. I want to live in a mansion, Beverly Hills or wherever. Well, the Bible promises that our shepherd will take care of our needs. We won't want or lack. It does not promise to take care of our greed. Jesus will take care of your needs, not your greeds. So the Lord is my shepherd, puffed out chest. I shall not want. He, the shepherd, makes me, the sheep, to lie down in green pastures or in the the tender grass. Why is that important? I talked about that sheep that I saw on the side of the road eating thistles and rocks. That's what sheep do if they're left to their own devices. They will literally eat anything. They will eat things that are bad for them, things that are good for them. They'll eat rocks, they'll eat thorny bushes, all kinds of stuff. But the good shepherd knows what they need and he takes them to the green pasture where the grass is growing, where... Again, if you read this book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, we get insight because we don't live in a primarily agrarian culture where we have crops and we're raising cattle and we're raising sheep and understand this. Now, some people do, but I didn't grow up that way. I grew up in the city, concrete jungle. So I had no understanding when I read this. But if you understand what a shepherd does for the sheep, he goes out and he spends the winter months and the the months leading up to the time where they're going to go out and eat in the pasture, he spends time preparing that land and tilling the land and throwing out the seed and and watering it so that there will be lush green pastures for his sheep to go graze in. And so he leads them to these green pastures. It says he leads me beside the still waters. Again, why is this important? Well, you don't want the sheep bending over to get their drink out of the, the like class five rapids because what happens? They slip, they fall. Now they're in the rapids. They're getting swept away or they're drowning. So he leads them to the, the nice pools of clean, still water where they can drink water that's healthy for them, that's not filled with parasites and Again, a sheep left to his own device, what will he do? He'll go to any dirty mud hole and drink water. But the good shepherd keeps them from that. He leads them to the still waters, the calm waters, where they're not going to get swept away. He restores my soul. Think about how good that is from the, the sheep's perspective. Sheep are skittish animals. You can, you can think of like, Oh man, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay the bills? What am I going to eat? What are we going to drink? Oh my gosh, maybe I need to go out and get a get a job. Maybe I need to do something that I shouldn't be doing in order to pr- pr- provide for myself. No, the good shepherd will take care of you. 
He will calm, lead you to this place. And then when you find out and you look back and you say, wow, he has taken care of me. Doesn't that just refresh you to know that Jesus comes through? He comes through for us. He leads me in the paths, <coughs> in the paths of righteousness or in right living. He's not, he's not leading the sheep down, a, down an area or down a way that they shouldn't be going. He's leading them the right direction in a path of righteousness. If we follow Jesus, we're not going to find ourselves in places where we shouldn't be. Sometimes, uh, you know, I worked as a police officer for a long time. So five of those years, I worked in a school district. And you hear it outside of that too in law enforcement, but I used to hear this. There's kids in trouble all the time. Kid, not just law enforcement trouble, but just school trouble. And they would end up in our office and we would talk to them and, oh, it's just so hard to do good and do the right thing. And no, it's not. It's hard to do the wrong thing. You actually have to think about doing the wrong thing. Okay, if I do this, how am I going to get away with it? How am I not going to get caught? How can I avoid the police? How can I avoid getting caught by the principal or whatever? If you just do the right thing, you don't have to worry about all of that. If you stay close to Jesus and you follow Jesus, you will be doing the right thing. You won't have to worry about, am I doing the wrong thing? Am I going the wrong way? No, you're going the right way because the good shepherd is leading you in paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. What's his name? Jesus is his name. Our God is salvation. But this speaks of the name of God that we see throughout the Old Testament, the capital Y-H-W-H, the Yahweh, which means the becoming one or the existing one. God is whoever we need him to be. He's our provider. He's our healer. For it, it talks about God being a husband to the widows, to being a father to the fatherless. He is whatever we need him to be. He is the becoming one. Whatever you need, turn to him. He can provide for you. <clears throat> but we do this, or he does all of this for the sheep for his name's sake. Why? It brings the shepherd glory. When the shepherd takes care of the sheep and people can look around and go, man, that's a bunch of well taken care of sheep over there. Who is their shepherd? And then you look across the field and you go, what happened to those sheep? The ones on the other side of the fence, they're all scrawny and dirty and overgrown and not taking, who's their shepherd? No, it, there's a desire. I want to be in this pasture. I want to be taken care of like those sheep. It brings our shepherd glory for him to take care of us. Now, so that's sort of like, if we're looking at this like a song, a psalm, a song, verses 1 um, through 3a there for his name's sake, or 1 through 3 for his name's sake, that's like verse 1 of your song, right? Now verse 2 of your song begins here in this next part. And this is, this is where we get the funeral idea of this psalm because of this one verse Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now everybody takes that verse and goes, well, this is a death psalm. This is a, a psalm for funerals. No, this is not a psalm of death. It's a psalm of life. Look at how the sheep is taken care of. Look at how he's boasting with his puffed out chest. It's my shepherd who's doing all this for me. This, I'm living the good life because of my shepherd. And then he begins to say, even though, yea, though I walk through the valley of of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So this sheep is saying, even though there's some scary things, there's wolves and there's bears and there's lions. Oh my, out there. There's all these things. There's death and there's war and there's famine and there's... All. I don't have to fear because my shepherd is with me. That's why. 
So is this an appropriate psalm for a deathbed? Is it an appropriate psalm for a funeral? Absolutely, but we should be boasting about the life that that sheep lived because of their shepherd, not just something we read to bring people comfort right? in, in time. Right? Because again, if you're reading this psalm at the funeral of an unbeliever, it means nothing because they've been in the care of a hireling. They've been in the care of the wolf and they have been ultimately at death. They have been destroyed. But for the believer, when we read this psalm, it is an absolute expression of the life that I have lived because of my shepherd. So if you're going to read this psalm or at your funeral, or you're going to have somebody read this psalm at your deathbed, Make sure that there's an understanding that you want this read as a joyful experience because of the life that you have lived under the care of your shepherd. And so, yea, though I walk. <coughs> Sorry, this uh, cough that I've had, the doctor told me is giving me an asthmatic response, something I've never had before. Uh, and so it's causing me to cough. They actually gave me an inhaler instead of antibiotics, so pray for me. But, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and cough my head off, I will fear no evil because my shepherd is with me, right? But you are with me. That's what it's all about, being with the shepherd. We see it all the way back in the book of Genesis where God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. He wanted to be with Adam. We see it in the nation of Israel as the tabernacle was set up right in the middle of the camp so that God was right in their midst, right in the center of everything they do. We see it in the New Testament and the book of Ephesians that we're being built up for a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, that the God wants to be with us. Why can I fear no evil? Because my shepherd is with me. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. They know, I call my sheep. They know my voice. They follow me. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The good shepherd is with us. And notice this. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now this rod that it speaks of, it's a rod of correction. The staff is a guide. And so you've seen the shepherd's hook, the stick that they, they carry that has a hook on one end and the other end of it is just like a, like a, a rod, it's a, a bat or something like that. The rod portion of it is used for correction. What, what do you mean, correction? These are sheep. Again, sheep are not that bright. Sheep will wander away from their shepherd. Sheep will try to go into the pasture that is bad. They will wander away from the group. There's safety in the flock. Because a shepherd is with the flock. But if one sheep wanders off, uh-oh, guess what happens when a sheep wanders off by itself? They are easy pickings for the wolves because they are not with their shepherd. So if you have one, if a sheep keeps wandering off to go by itself or keeps, and they're kind of rebellious, they don't want to, submit to the care of their shepherd and so they start doing things their own way and wandering off much like we do people right the shepherd will have to bust out this rod that he has and give them a little whack to get them to stay in line it's a it's a means of correction this the book i was mentioning by philip kellerman um, I don't remember. He's got a, a, it's like a trilogy of books that he has, but the, the one that I've read is a shepherd looks at Psalm 23, but he's got two other books that accompany that one. And it's, 
it's in one of his books. I don't remember which one, but he, he talks about that sometimes a sheep can be so out of line where they're, they're trying to wander off and go do their own thing that they start to lead other sheep astray. And those other sheep will begin to follow the one that's sort of wandering off. This again, sounds familiar to like people, right? What the shepherd will have to do is that sort of like uh, type A sheep that keeps wandering off is the shepherd will actually have to break the leg or legs of the sheep. But it's not to be mean. It's to break the sheep. He'll break the leg. He'll set the leg. And this, because the sheep can't walk, he then has to put the sheep on his shoulders. And he carries the sheep with him in that broken condition, wherever he needs it to go. By the time the sheep is ready to walk again, they have formed such a bond that the sheep will never leave his side again. All right, it's a beautiful picture, this rod of correction that God uses in our lives. Sometimes he has to break us in order that we will never leave his side again, All right? And then we, it says, your staff, they come for me. The staff is meant, you know, you're kind of just drifting a little or you go chasing after a little bit of the wrong thing. It can get you with that hook and just kind of gently bring you back where you need to be. Then he says, verse three of the song, <coughs> you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You Anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. So he's saying here, you prepare a table. Well, this isn't like a, a table that we eat on, you know. This, this isn't a, a table that we eat on like our dinner. This is a table that would be like a mesa out in a, a plateau, a, a table lands. And this is sort of like, the area, again, this shepherd looks at Psalm 23, gives you a lot of understanding, but they would walk their sheep long distances because the sheep feast well. They, they go to the, uh, the green pastures and the still waters and they eat well and the shepherd's taking care of them. Well, what happens to sheep is if they just eat and then they lay down, they get comfy like us after Thanksgiving dinner. Right, and then they want to take a nap. And they they kind of start to roll a little bit, and they end up on their back with their feet up in the air, and they get into a position that's called cast. Mm -hmm. And when a sheep is cast, they can actually die relatively quickly in a cast position. And so there's only uh, the shepherd will actually have to go. They can't get righted. They can't get back on their feet after becoming in this cast position. So the, sh the shepherd will have to pick the sheep up and then stand there and massage its legs to get the blood flowing again and then get them walking to get rid of some of that excess uh, food they ate from the green pasture and the still waters. And so what the shepherds have to do is they, they take their sheep to feed and then they have to walk them and they take them to feed and they walk them and they will end up or they can end up in what's this table that he's talking about, which is really like a plateau or a mesa. It's an area that the shepherds prepared. He's removed the rocks beforehand, all the burrs, all the things that can do damage to the sheep. It's a place where the sheep can rest, where they can eat well. But if they don't get up and walk, then they become cast. And we don't want to become a cast sheep. So we want to feed on our Bibles. We want to feed on the word of God, right? But then we want to go walk. We want to put these things to use in our life so that we're not becoming cast and just fat, dying, uh, you know, um, with a head full of knowledge, but never practically using any of it. And so he gets them up here to this table lands right in the presence of their enemies, right? They're on a place up high. The enemies can see where they're at. But again, they're protected because the shepherd is there. Now, 
he says, you anoint my head with oil. Oil in the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit. And so what is the need for the shepherd to anoint the head of a sheep with oil? Well, you know, you ever been around livestock? There's lots of flies and little bugs that like to fly around them. And sheep in particular are very bothered by flies. Literally, the, the, the flies that will fly around their head will drive them mad. They will actually ram their heads into rocks and things trying to get rid of the flies and do damage to themselves. And so because of that, the shepherd will take the anointing oil and he will pour the oil over their head so that it's running down and it, the oil keeps the flies away. It's a, ma- a means of protection for the sheep. But if you think about that in our own lives, the Holy Spirit poured out in our lives keeps us going, keeps the flies away. Right? It protects us. He protects us from the flies, from the Lord of the flies. Right, so he anoint my head with oil, and then he's he says my cup runs over. He's like, look at look at the sheep's response. Oh, you're so good, my shepherd. You anoint my head. You lead me to these green pastures and still waters. Oh, your rod and your staff. This I'm not mad. You did it for my good, and and you go up to this this prepare this table before us, and you keep the bugs off me with the oil. And the the sheep's life is overflowing because of his shepherd. The sheep is living the good life. Oh, my my cup is running over. The Bible tells us that when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, our lives will overflow as well. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Jesus said, anyone who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Speaking of the Holy Spirit in my life. And so he says, my cup runs over. And then it says, this, this could be like your chorus of the song. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But I want you to notice, because I think we often group these together, like surely goodness and mercy, three things, right? But what's a surely? Surely temple? I don't, I don't, right? What's a surely? It's, I think there, we're missing some punctuation. It should be surely, mm, exclamation point, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. You know, that, that term follow me in the original Hebrew language, it should read like this. Surely, goodness and mercy shall hunt me down. Isn't that awesome? Goodness and mercy from the Lord, from our shepherd, hunting us down. Wherever you go, wherever you are, think of the Apostle Paul in jail, being hunted down by the goodness and mercy of God. Think of people that you know that have passed away with under the care of the good shepherd. And they're, they're not afraid to die. They're not in fear of death. They're not even mad that they're dying. They're looking forward to meeting Jesus because why? The good shepherd, surely goodness and mercy have been hunting them down. They realize it. The apostle Paul from jail cells realized that The Lord has me here. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm in this place because this is right where he wants me. Will you pray for me? Not that I get released, but that I have an effective ministry of sharing the gospel to those in Caesar's household. And he's writing these letters to these different churches. Why? Because he knows the good shepherd has his best interest in mind. If we really believe what the Bible says, and yes, all things work together for good for those that love God, that are the called according to his purpose. Do I really believe that all things are working together for good? If I do, I know surely goodness and mercy are following me. It doesn't matter. If you take my life, Paul said again, to live is Christ, to die is gain. How do you hurt a man like that? He knows 
God's taking care of him no matter where he's at in life. And so he's saying, surely goodness and mercy shall hunt me down, follow me. Just sometimes? All in the Bible, Hebrew, Greek, English, doesn't matter what language, all means all. There's no hidden meaning behind all. All the days of my life, notice this, and I will dwell. I will, again, tabernacle. I will hang out. I will be with in the house of the Lord forever. Not just now, but we need to see ourselves seated eternally as Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians. We need to see ourselves seated in the heavenlies. That's where we are now because of Jesus, our good shepherd. Our life does not end when we stop breathing here. Our life really begins at that point because we have eternity to spend, forever to spend. It's it's like when you think of eternity, I want you to think in your mind as far back as you can ever remember. There's a, there's what's called like a vanishing point right, where I can't remember anymore. And there's there's a vanishing point forward where I can't remember anymore. That's eternity beyond the vanishing point forever. Well, Jesus is good. He's our shepherd. He's with us always. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your time and your word. I pray that we will let these things just soak in and sink into our lives and our hearts and that we would just walk with you knowing that you are our good shepherd. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can't wait to see you guys again next week. Remember, we will be at the venue at the ranches. God bless you.